Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this week's AMSSM Sports Ultrasound Case Series presentation. We are we are chugging along here with the uh, fellow portion of these presentations. <clears throat> and as I, I think I've said probably every single time, I absolutely love the fellows portion. They they do a phenomenal job and these cases are great and, and very comprehensive. And this is, you know, really my my favorite part of this whole this whole case series, to be honest. So um, today we are fortunate um, to have uh, Dr. Megan Burleson and, and Liz Wen from the University of Washington uh, join us today. They, as with our last two presenters are joining us bright and early from the West Coast. I really appreciate them them joining and, and being willing to give a presentation at such an early hour uh, for them. So they are gonna present a, a, a case today of an AC joint um, sprain. And uh, with that, I will let them take it away. All right, thank you, Dr. Cruz. Um, so my name is Megan and I'm here with my co-fellow Liz and we will be giving our presentation on AC joint sprain for this um, case presentation series. Uh, we have no disclosures. And we wanted to thank our faculty for help with this case, as well as a special thanks to our UW faculty and mentors for their time and commitment to our ultrasound education this year. And for our learning objectives, we will review the protocol for sonographic evaluation of shoulder pain and we'll apply it to our case today. We'll also discuss AC joint pathology, as well as review the ultrasound report. So starting off with our case, we have a 22-year-old male, a right-hand dominant rugby player who presented with acute left shoulder pain. His symptoms have been ongoing for about a week prior to his presentation. He has sustained a tackle and landing directly on his left shoulder during a rugby game. He complained of sharp pain, which was localized anteriorly and superiorly without radiation. He also complained of limited range of motion with pain exacerbated with shoulder abduction and adduction. He denied having any associated numbness or tingling in the left upper extremity and also reported that he had never injured his left shoulder in the past. On physical exam, he had no obvious deformity um, and no soft tissue swelling or bruising was noted over the left shoulder. He did have focal tenderness to palpation along the AC joint. He did not have any tenderness to palpation along the SC joint, the proximal clavicle, glenohumeral joint. Um, and he also had no obvious motion of the distal clavicle with palpation. For range of motion, he was only able to abduct his arm to 90 degrees and had reproducible pain with passive and active abduction. He also had reproducible pain with cross-body adduction. He did have full internal and external rotation. In terms of his strength, it was globally decreased due to pain, and this is with all manual muscle testing compared to his contralateral side, and uh, we graded it as a four plus out of five. In terms of special tests, um, pertinent positives was his O'Brien's test was positive, his Sperling's test was negative, empty can test was negative, Speed's test was negative, Hawkins and Nearest was also negative, and he was also neurovascularly intact, so the sensation to light touch was intact and distal pulses were also intact. In terms of our differential diagnosis for this case, so AC joint injury was high in our differential at that time, labral pathology, rotator cuff pathology, clavicle fractures, and glenohumeral subluxation or dislocation were also on our differential. So we did obtain radiographs and we wanted to be sure that we got our standard AP and axillary lateral views, but also wanted to make sure that we got a Zenka view as well, because this is the most accurate view to evaluate suspected AC joint injuries. And this is because with our standard AP views, the AC joint uh, will be overpenetrated. And so oftentimes small or subtle lesions can be overlooked. But in this case, um, his radiographs were normal. 
So then we moved on to um, our diagnostic ultrasound and for our scanning protocol, we did complete um, shoulder exam, um, starting anteriorly with the biceps tendon then moving to the rotator interval, subscapularis tendon, and then proceeding with some dynamic testing at that time, and then moving to the coracohumeral and coracopromial ligaments, and then evaluating the AC joint. And in this case, we did do dynamic views as well. And then moving to the suprascapular notch, spinal glenoid notch, the posterior glenohumeral joint, infraspinatus, teres minor, supraspinatus, and then looking at the subchromial subdeltoid bursa, as well as doing some more dynamic testing. And in terms of our transducer selection, we used the linear high frequency probe. And we also had the patient positioned in the seated position facing towards the ultrasound with the symptomatic arm in 90 degrees of flexion and their forearm supinated and resting on the ipsilateral thigh. And when we evaluate the supraspinatus tendon, we had the patient placed in the modified CRAS position. So first we start with the biceps tendon in short axis. And here to our um, left, um, the lateral side, we have the greater tubercle, the lesser tubercle medially, our biceps tendon here in the groove and short axis. Then we have our transverse humeral ligament running over the top and our deltoid above that, and then our subscat medially. And then as we scan down to the pec tendon, you can see the biceps tendon and short axis coming in just beneath it. And then if we uh, scan back up to the rotator interval, you can see the biceps tendon and short axis, subscat medially and the supraspinatus laterally. And then we looked at the biceps tendon in long axis and this was a normal biceps tendon, no surrounding fluid or thickening. And so we start with our report. Um, so the biceps tendon was normally positioned in the bicipital groove and intact with no evidence of discontinuity. So then we moved to our, immediately to our subscapularis and we looked at it starting in long axis. And here we have um, the subscap just above, which is the inserts on the lesser tubercle. Uh, we have our biceps tendon laterally and then the coracroid medially. And then we also did dynamic testing at this point, um, just to make sure that there was no subluxation of the biceps tendon in the bicepital groove, and then also making sure that there was no impingement or uh, subcoracoid effusion with dynamic testing. And then we uh, looked at the subscapularis and short axis. And this is the normal appearance of the subscap. Um, it is a multi-pinnate muscle. And so it's normal to have these hyperechoic areas with hypoechoic areas in between. And again, subscap, lesser tubercle and deltoid on top. So moving on with our report, we have a normal intact tendon without evidence of thickening or abnormal hypoechoic regions, no subcoracoid bursal effusion or biceps tendon subluxation with dynamic internal rotation. And then we moved on to our coracohumeral and coracochromial ligaments. So first we looked at the coracohumeral ligament, which it um, originates from the uh, lateral side of the coracoid and then it extends um, over the rotator interval here. So this is our coracohumeral ligament, deltoid, lesser tubercle, and then coracoid. And then we looked at our coracochromial uh, ligament, which extends from the acromion to the coracoid as well. And moving on with our report, the coracohumeral and the coracochromial ligaments are intact. So then we uh, will take a brief pause just to go over the anatomy of the AC joint. So we scan superiorly to the AC joint. And in terms of the anatomy, um, it is a diarthroidal joint and it has the articulation of the medial acromion uh, with the distal clavicle. And it also has this fibrocartilaginous intraarticular disc that lies within the joint. 
for stability, the horizontal motion and the anterior and posterior stability is controlled by the acromioclavicular ligaments here. There are four components to it, the superior, inferior, anterior, and posterior components. And the posterior and superior components are most important for stability. For vertical motion and superior and inferior stability, um, that is controlled by our coracoclavicular ligaments. We have the conoid and the trapezoid. The conoid is located more medial and it inserts onto the clavicle medially. This ligament uh, here is most important for vertical stability. And then we have the trapezoid, which is just lateral to the conoid and it inserts onto to the clavicle um, laterally. And then, which is not listed here, but we also have our dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder, which is the anterior deltoid, as well as the trapezius. Then we'll go into our AC joint pathology. Thanks, Meg. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and pick up where Meg left off. I'm going to go briefly over a kind of the common conditions we see with AC joint pathology, starting with the common condition we're discussing today of an AC joint sprain or separation. There are several types, um, which we'll talk about shortly, but this is often occurred doing, due to the trauma to a joint, um, often from a blow or direct fall to the shoulder. And as Megan mentioned, there can be ligament disruption, in this case, a chromioclavicular or coracoclavicular, if high enough in severity of separation. Other things to consider with AC joint pathology would include more repetitive trauma to the AC joint, causing damage to the distal end of the clavicle, resulting in distal clavicle osteolysis. And then given with the AC joint pain in that area, we can also consider osteoarthritis as part of our differential. So this is the Rockwood classification used to, <clears throat> to show the degree of AC joint separation. As you can see, there are different types here with increase in type correlating to increase in severity and highlighting what can happen with each ligament the exam you can see with an AC joint separation, the coracoclavicular distance as part of diagnosis with radiographic findings and then treatment options, as well as imaging to kind of give a, another idea of what an AC joint sprain would look like determined based on grade. So going back to our patient here, Upon ultrasound for his left shoulder, you can see here with his acromion and clavicle that there's this focal hypochoic area concerning for effusion or distension of the joint capsule. He had point tenderness to palpation with the transducer during this exam. And as Megan mentioned, dynamic testing we felt was warranted for his, this patient. So up on the top video here, we have a comparison view of an AC joint for this patient where there's minimal mobility of the joint space, there's not as much of a focal effusion compared to his other shoulder. And then on this bottom video here, this is the affected shoulder of the patient. And as you can see here, there's that focal hypochoic area again, this time with a little bit increased mobility of that joint space and a little bit more widening compared to the other side. So to continue with our report, we included that there was some mild cortical irregularity seen with a focal hypochoic area here suggesting a fusion versus distension of the joint capsule with dynamic testing, in this case with cross-body adduction, revealing widening and increased mobility of that joint space. Moving then to the posterior portion of the shoulder ultrasound, we started with the suprascapular notch, bringing that transducer down to the spine of the scapula looking into the suprascapular notch here and evaluating for the suprascapular nerve, any space occupying lesions or cysts. We were able to see the supraspinatus and trapezius muscle bellies, which appeared isoechoic and no indications of atrophy or fatty infiltration. And so we reported no abnormality of the suprascapular nerve within the notch and no atrophy of the supraspinatus muscle belly. Moving then down to the spinoglenoid notch, which is about the same thought process we had looking into the notch for evaluation of the suprascapular nerve, looking for any kind of cysts or any other kind of lesions concerning for an injury here. 
Um, again, no abnormality of the suprascapular nerve within the spina glenoid notch, no cysts were seen, and no atrophy of what we could visualize of the infraspinatus muscle belly as well. Taking a look more now into the posterior glenohumeral joint a little closely here, we can see the humeral head, the glenoid, and what we can visualize of the labrum with the ultrasound, as well as the infraspinatus tendon running across here. Here we looked for effusions, any sort of arthropathy or concern for injury here for this patient. And in this case, there was no glenohumeral joint effusion or arthropathy. Moving now to see the infraspinatus more, we started with the infraspinatus and short axis here to see the tendon, the muscle belly here, and then rotating the transducer to see the tendon and long axis again over the glenohumeral joint with a little bit of the labrum you can see in this view. And for us, we saw no abnormalities with the tendon, no areas of decreased echogenicity, no signs of cortical irregularity here. With dynamic testing, looking at the infraspinatus more at the attachment site, we saw no areas of hypoechoic regions, calcifications, or other abnormalities with the tendon for the infraspinatus muscle. Moving then on to the teres minor through our ultrasound, we saw it in short and in long axis. So starting with short axis, this is the muscle belly of the teres minor with the infraspinatus right there. Um, these two muscle bellies looked isochoic. There wasn't any sign of atrophy or fatty infiltration here. And then rotating the transducer to get the teres minor in long axis and its attachment site here. The tendon also looked intact, no areas that were thickened or any kind of hypoechoic regions that we saw that would indicate abnormalities with the teres minor for this patient. So again, with our ultrasound report, we included that this muscle was normal without evidence of tendon thickening, hypoechoic regions, calcifications, assorted cortical irregularity, or any evidence of muscle atrophy. And then moving on to the supraspinatus, we, at this point we had the patient in modified crass with that elbow back with extension of the shoulder still seated. In short axis, we can see that we got the biceps tendon in view here to make sure we got the full anterior margin of the supraspinatus um, underneath the deltoid musculature above the joint here and rotating the transducer to get the supraspinatus tendon also in long axis. Um, from what we could tell, no abnormalities were seen with the supraspinatus tendon or the muscle with any kind of evidence of tendon thickening, hypoechoic regions, calcifications, or other irregularity here. To then be able to look at here from the supraspinatus to evaluate for any sort of bursitis or impingement, we wanted to see if there was any bursal thickening or any kind of fluid apparent here. And as you can tell here, the bursa was minimally expanded here, no kind of thickening or extension here of fluid. Upon dynamic testing to evaluate for subacromial impingement, we get the acromion in view here. And with dynamic testing, you can see good clearance of that tendon here and no indications of subacromial impingement. So we included in our report, no focal anechoic region to suggest a distended or thickened bursa or indications of bursitis and no evidence of subacromial impingement on dynamic shoulder abduction. So to conclude and kind of summarize everything we talked about with this, this was a diagnostic ultrasound for the left shoulder for indications of pain, acute mechanism of injury, and now limited range of motion. In comparison to the initial x-rays of the left shoulder we obtained for this patient on his visit, we used a linear high-frequency probe, as Megan mentioned previously, and had the patient placed in the seated position, supinated forearm, facing the ultrasound machine, Assessing for dynamic evaluation were needed and structures of interest in both long and short axis with comparison views as needed. As you can see here, the biceps tendon was evaluated with the long head in the bicep little groove, no evidence of discontinuity. The subscapularis tendon also appeared normal with internal and external rotation and the tendon itself appeared normal and intact and no subcoracoid bursal effusion or tendon subluxation from the biceps with dynamic testing as well. 
We were able to visualize the coracohumeral and coracal chromial ligaments, and those also appeared intact. And then looking at the remainder of the rotator cuff muscles, the supraspinatus tendon in the modified craft position, as well as the infraspinatus and teres minor's tendon, also evaluating with no evidence of tendon thickening or any other irregularities concerning for a rotator cuff injury. And then nothing with subacromial impingement with dynamic shoulder abduction or any sort of focal anechoic regions to suggest bursitis for this patient. As mentioned before, with the acromioclavicular joint, there was some cortical irregularity with a focal hypoechoic area above the joint suggesting effusion versus distension of the joint capsule. And dynamic testing of that joint showed a little bit more mobility compared to the other side with a little bit more widening of that joint space. And then the remainder of the shoulder exam, the posterior glenohumeral joint showing no effusion or arthropathies. And then within the notch for both suprascapular and spinal glenoid, no abnormality in the suprascapular nerve. Cyst, no cysts were seen and no atrophy of the muscle bellies that we visualized with this. So our impression for this patient, based on his initial presentation and x-rays that appeared normal, appeared to be a type one AC joint sprain. However, once looking at it through the modality of the ultrasound, Given that increased mobility of that joint with the widening of the joint space, we did wonder if there was a little bit more horizontal instability to the AC joint, and he might have had a higher grade AC joint sprain than previously indicated, um, given what we found on dynamic ultrasound findings. So we put him as a type 1 to maybe type 2 AC joint sprain. These were the references we used to help us with our presentation and for some of the anatomy portions of this. So thanks everyone so much for listening to our talk. We are happy to open the floor now for comments and questions. All right, thanks guys. Um, so, so if anybody has any questions, you can just unmute yourself or you can throw them um, in the comments or chat box. You know, I'll just, I'll be completely honest guys. I mean, you just set the bar to a new level with that presentation. I mean, that was, <clears throat> that's exactly what we want. And that's, that's the exact presentation that we had in mind when we started this, you know, two or two and a half years ago. So, so really great job. Um, really great job. That was, you know, that was, that was perfect. Um, your images are fantastic also. So, so great job um, with that. So I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to make a couple of comments here. Um, so my protocol is for shoulder is the exact same as, as yours. I do it in the exact same uh, sequence in the exact same fashion, um, again, with the exact same protocol. The only thing that I do differently is for my supraspinatus imaging, I like them on sideline. Um, I think it's easier for me. Um, I think maybe it's more comfortable for the patient, but you know, you could pull 10 people and five of them are going to do sideline, five of them are going to do seated. So there's nothing wrong at all with the seated, um, the seated position. It's just the way my brain works. It works better sideline. But again, seated is, is completely normal and, 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 and perfectly reasonable. Um, you hit all the key points of the protocol. I think that's important, you know, clinically when you see this athlete or this patient, and for all the world, this screams AC joint pathology, right? It can be very easy just to say, well, I'm at this AC joint, I'm just going to throw my transducer on there, take a look at that, and then not look at anything else. And you can you can miss pathology really easily. And, and you guys did a fantastic job, you know, saying, I know my protocol. I start with my biceps tendon. We're going to start there and go sequentially, and I'll get to my AC joint when I get there, but I got to make sure I don't miss anything else. So, so that's a really important point. Um, and, and, and great job, um, great job on that. A uh, couple other things. So for me, this is just my own stylistic approach to this. So if I'm, if I'm commenting on, on AC joint pathology, um, in my impression, um, I will, I'll talk about, you know, which, which ligaments I, I feel are disrupted and I'll talk about you know, the presence or absence of instability and so on and so forth. And then like you guys did in the um, summary, I'll provide somebody, you know, with, with, or whoever referred them over with a grade uh, for this degree of injury, um, which I think is helpful for the refer referring provider. Uh, the other thing, when you are measuring or looking at the AC joint, uh, a couple things here, I think, I think side to side comparisons can be really helpful um, to determine whether or not something or the AC joint is, is widened um, or not. You can take measurements. The, um, 
the reference ranges are, are a, a, a bit all over the board. Um, some folks will talk about, you know, four to six millimeters is a normal AC joint distance in females and you know, maybe five to seven or so. Um, in males, I, I personally, you know, I'll comment um, on the distance of the AC joint, but I don't know that I've really found it overly helpful because there is so much variability um, in, in, in different patients. So just, just something to, uh, to, to comment on there. And then lastly, you know, dynamic imaging, we, we harp on this all the time. That's one of the main reasons we're doing ultrasound, right? It's dynamic and you can watch these tissues move and joints move and, and doing dynamic imaging here, like you guys did, I think is, is, is incredibly important. Um, there is some data and I'll be honest, I don't do this all that often because again, I don't think it's personally helpful, but there's some data in the literature, some cadaveric studies looking at normal, um, normal translation, normal gapping within the AC joint with an intact AC, um, ligament with a disrupted AC ligament and so on and so forth for the different grades of, um, of AC joint, uh, pathology. And, you know, if I'm remembering correctly, it's somewhere around like 1.3 or 1.4 millimeters of gapping, what it would, would suggest a complete AC ligament rupture. So again, just something else to think about. Um, but like you did, you know, your dynamic, um, imaging is, is, um, is super important for these patients. Um, I think that is all I have. I have to try fairly hard to think of comments, guys, because again, you, you did a really, really fantastic job. Um, anybody have any questions? Going once, going twice. All right. All right. Well, then we will wrap it at that. Um, Megan and Liz, again, really exceptional, um, really great job. You, you followed the, the protocol exactly, exactly how we wanted. So kudos to you and kudos to your team out at UW for, you know, obviously giving you guys exceptional ultrasound uh, education there. So great job. Um, all right. So that's it. Uh, we are off per usual next week, and then we'll be back on Oh gosh, two weeks from now is March 11th. Uh, March 11th, uh, Scott Class from Columbia he, um, is going to be given a case or given a presentation on common fibular nerve entrapment at the lateral knee. So thanks everybody. Happy Friday. Have a great weekend. Stay warm if you're in cold places like me. Stay cool if you're not in cold places like me. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you guys. Thank you.